What a joy and blessing it is to come together to sing his praises, to sing from our hearts considering the greatness of our God, his holiness, our Savior, who in him we have been accounted as holy and righteous, have a boldness to draw near, and then a time to spend in God's word. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. This morning we will be looking at Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Please do stand with me, if you would, in honor and respect for God's word opened and read. And listen closely as I read God's word. And may he really just begin to open it up by his spirit in our hearts and minds. Listen to God's word. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness in the land of deserts and pits, and in the land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children, I will contend. For cross from coast to coast of Cyprus and sea, send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there is any such thing that has happened. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked and utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Please be seated. And let's pray. Lord, again, as we turn our attention now to consider your word, what a glory it is to open these ancient words communicated so many thousands of years ago to the people of Israel. And yet as we stand here today, See the absolute power and pertinence, reality and relevance of these words, even for us as we stand here today in this place. God, I ask that you would bring your word to the hearts and minds of your people with great power, that again you would stir us to a careful contemplation and recollection and self-examination. Lord, where necessary, I pray that you will bring conviction that in our hearts we'll all be stirred with a sense of amazement at who you are and the greatness and the hope that is grounded entirely in you. Lord, bless our time in the word I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now let's take this up together 
as we come into chapter 2. Now, one of the things I did mention as we take up Jeremiah, this book, it's through a broad season with, with many different kings going on. Even though the book begins in the days of Josiah and there was some external restraint that was going on among the people, it was clear that there was still wickedness in their heart and God was beginning to present these things. I've titled the message for today, Crime and Punishment. Now, for those of you who are readers, you'd be familiar with Crime and Punishment, a, a famous book by Dostoevsky. And in that book, one of the things is that man actually, the protagonist thinks that he might be able to do something that is absolutely wrong and wicked and vile, taking another person's life for his own ill-gotten gains, and that because of the gains he would receive and the good he would be able to do with it, that somehow he would be able to overcome the crime that he committed and just bring good. He thought there would be no punishment, but he learned in the course of that unfolding story written by a man there were consequences consequences of conscience consequences in in multiple areas of life and that is an observation of an individual who doesn't even know fully the grace of God it is important for us to understand that when there is sin there is necessary judgment that will come from it for every crime, for every deed done in the body, there are going to be consequences that are faced. And the scripture indicates this not just as a saying at the very end, but we see it replicated and unfolded over and over and over again throughout the word of God. I want us to take up this passage and see some challenging and good and encouraging things and then some strong warnings and just pray that God would be pleased by his spirit to meet each one of us where we find ourselves this morning. The first thought I want to ten, attend to this morning comes from the beginning of this and it says in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 1 and following, 1 and 2 really, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, and how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. The first thing I just want to draw our attention to is this. It seems to indicate some degree of a promising commitment or of a promising beginning. Things seemed to start well. I've got to tell you this, in my own vain attempts to figure out when Israel did this <laughs> devotion, uh, love as a bride and following, it was difficult to find it. They were grumbling f within Egypt, they were grumbling from the get-go on the departure from Egypt. It may be that this section is speaking of those who were underaged, and not part of those who rebelled in the wilderness, but would still those underage ones would have to wait 40 years in the wilderness while judgment came and all of the older ones died and passed away in the wilderness and then they would enter into the promised land. But in this idealized thing, it's interesting to note this. It said, God says, I remember. That's not shocking for us, is it? God remembers God knows everything. He is able to call to mind every secret thought, every mysterious deed. You know, and this is actually quite positive because he says, I remember the devotion, your love as a bride, how you followed me. Well, if he's going to remember the good things, we like it. But does he remember the bad things as well? Well, with regard to mankind, he will but the glorious promise of the new covenant is what? When we are in Christ Jesus, when we are forgiven, he will remember our sins no more. He is not going to call them to mind for the purposes of judgment against us who are in Christ. And that is a glorious place 
to be. But I want us to consider for a moment the warning here that's getting ready to unfold to the children of Israel of a promising beginning, but then an unsuccessful life and continuance. And this is not unique to them. These warnings even come to us in the New Testament in uncomfortable language, but in Matthew 13, as Jesus is speaking about the seed that is sown on various kinds of ground, right? There is seed on the, on the path, then on the rocky ground, then on the thorny ground, and then on the good soil. Well, regarding the two in the middle, not the path, but the rocky ground and the thorny ground, in Matthew 13, verse 20, Jesus explains it this way. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this one hears the word. So it's an occasion. The word, the gospel has been shared. They hear the word, and Jesus says, immediately receives it with joy. And that's an encouraging thing, right? And our response in that moment is, yes! But then the scripture, Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, yet he has no root in himself. He was excited about the prospects of heaven. He was excited about the prospects of forgiveness he was excited about the prospects of a God who is looking over him with love and care, but it seems he had not at the root of it a love for God and Christ poured into his heart. And so it was founded on the promises for those of faith, but it wasn't rooted in faith. He, who would not like the promises of the gospel? All right, here you got eternal torment day and night forever and ever or eternal bliss where there's no pain, no sadness, no suffering, only joy, peace, righteousness, worship, and no sin. So who wants the glories of the new heaven and new earth? Are you in? Yes. yes. And, and who wants the other? All right, nobody verbalizes that. And, and so the, the sense is, oh, I, yeah, I would want those things. But my, the question more than that is, do you want Christ now more than any of these things? Do you have that root where he abides in you and you abide in him? Jesus then goes on to tell us uh, tragically about this uh, person, received it with joy. He had no root in himself, but endures for a while. And we've seen these individuals over the course of our lives many times. They endure for a while, but when tribulation and persecution arise, listen, on account of the word, People saying, I don't believe that about the scriptures. I don't believe that about God. I don't believe that we have to follow that anymore. They begin to what? Immediately, he falls away. So they receive the promises with joy, but when they realize that the path is a path that is fraught with persecution and pain and problems and tribulation and struggles, they say, I tried it, didn't work for me. Well, the work isn't to make the path easier. <laughs> the work is to set before us the great prize that is ahead. But he goes on in Matthew uh, 13 and speaks not only of those who seemed to receive it with joy but had no root, and you see it because they end up going away. It's not that that root was removed. They never had that root. It says this, of those that were among the thorns. So those were people who end up going out and then they're not joining among us, they're not gathering, they're not worshiping with us anymore. They've kind of abandoned the faith. Secondarily, verse 22, he says this, as for what is sown among the thorns. This is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Now, th this is not a person who necessarily stops going to church. They may still be going, attending, 
participating. So they haven't gone away. But what is, ha- what is the nature of their life? It's no different than the world. They're coming, but their life day by day is still captivated by the cares of this world, the things of this world. That's what they live for. And so the scripture begins to say, as a result of that, it proves unfruitful. We love that language of John chapter 15. Jesus says, everyone who abides in me will bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So this is a, this is a strong warning Now, I cannot and will not presume to judge anybody's heart because I cannot see it. God alone knows the heart. But the scriptures do warn, by their fruit you will know them. There are those who might think, I am in because I began well. I am in because I began with joy. I am in because I sort of received the word. Did you, though? Do you have that root that is in the love of Christ? Do you have it such that your love for him and your life is now characterized by Christ? We go back to that verse that almost everyone has memorized in part. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I wonder how many who profess Christ can Truly say, for me to live is Christ. And what's interesting is, if that's you, you know what you find? The warning from what God, uh, through Paul, tells to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. People will look at you and say, You're making too much of Christ. You're acting like the spiritual things and the word of God should somehow guide every decision and every perception and every thing that we value in life. You're acting like this has to be the primary foundation and moving principle. What about all these other things? And even as we heard this morning in the earlier hour, What about all these other things? Someday, they will be dissolved as of by fire. Whoosh! And gone. Oh, the good beginning, we love to see it, but oh, what a strong warning. Jesus gives another warning regarding that early faithfulness in Luke chapter 14. Verse 28 and following. And I've, I've put in your outline today many of the verses to make it easier to follow along or easier to look up afterward for family discussion. Jesus says this, Which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who see it will mock him. What is this? Incomplete. Nothing is, no one can live there. It's of no benefit to anyone. It can't protect anyone. What have you done? Saying, this man began to build but was not able to finish. Jesus is using just obvious observational experiences here. And he says, or what king who's getting ready to go out to, against another king in war won't sit down first and deliberate whether he will be able to, with his 10,000, meet him who comes against him with 20,000. In other words, he's going to say, okay, we're fewer in number, but we are more skilled in training, more fortified in weaponry. I think we can take them. If he looks at them and says, well, they're more in number, they're stronger, they're more experienced, they're better weaponized, I think we don't have a shot. Let's go get them. Thank you for that rousing speech, king before the battle. Who wants that, right? You know, it would seem like a bad decision. And he says, if not, while the other is far off, he sends a delegation for terms of peace. In other words, most of us at least have to take some thought beyond today, beyond right now, beyond this moment. 
We do it all the time in all kinds of practical things in practical ways. We have to. Then Jesus says it this way. So therefore, if any one of you does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Think, what? What is Jesus saying? That there would be an absolute readiness to renounce everything because there is a supreme valuing of Christ above all else. And he says, whoever doesn't have that, he's not going to make it. The cares of this world are going to come up. The troubles of the realities of life, and they're not going to get through. And he gives this warning. That person cannot be my disciple. Not that they were and went out. They were not actually disciples. They simply gathered among them. Then Jesus says these strong words. Salt is good, but if it has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Now again, this is Jesus talking about those who seem to uh, have started well, but then proven not to have continued in earnest. And the uncomfortable language at the end there is not even useful for the manure pile. Then it says, he who has ears, let him hear. We have that warning. Oh God, give us ears to hear. Early faithfulness is what characterized them. Devotion, kindness, loyalty. Like a bride they loved. It was, it was seemingly like a honeymoon period where all the little things were let go. Even further, this passage goes on in, in terms of a promising commitment to like exemplar first fruits. And by exemplar, that means they proved to be like a, an example of first fruits. Generally speaking, in Jeremiah 2, verse 3, it says, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. Now, we don't generally practice this, so let me uh, uh, give a sense of how this kind of works. Deuteronomy 18. For example, verse 4 and 5 says this, The first fruits of your grain, your wine, your oil, the first fleece of your sheep, you shall give to him. Which they were going to have to give sort of to the Lord that would be for his priests. The first fruits, they don't get to keep them. They belong to the Lord and the Lord's priests. For the Lord your God has chosen them out of all of the tribes. And so what the way that it was working God had marked out among the entire group that was all of the peoples and all of the clans and all of the families of the earth, God had marked out Israel that would be representative as set apart unto him. They would become his covenant people in the old covenant context. And as his covenant people, they would belong to him and relate to him in a way that no one else did. And if somebody other than a priest was to try to creep in and sneak and eat the first fruits, that was a problem. Because who were they designated for? They were holy unto the Lord and designated for his appointed people. And so it would be worthy of judgment and condemnation if somebody outside that community ate the first fruits. The way that God puts it here is, you were these first fruits to me. That was the old covenant. But I want to point us to something moving forward. They served that role as an example. The scriptures often, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, say these things happened to them, but they were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have fallen. Okay, And so when we come and look forward, we understand something even a little bit better and a little bit more beautiful in that. For example, God's word says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 and following. But we ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. 
Okay, the, you see, the, we have an idea. Under the Old Testament, God chose Israel as the first fruits that he would enter into a covenant relationship with, and they would be distinct among all of the peoples of the earth in terms of that covenant engagement. And that was an example of future first fruits. And the beauty of first, future first fruits is we're not simply sla saved from slavery to Egypt to still die in our sin in the wilderness. It says this, and this is Paul again writing to the Thessalonians, so these are not those generally of a Jewish background. And it says what? God chose you to what? Be or as first fruits to be saved. There is a sense in which uh, in the totality of the world, God has set, like he set his purposes upon Israel as his old covenant people, he has set his purposes on us in Christ that we would be his saved people. It says this, you will be saved through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. There is no salvation apart from the sanctifying work of the Spirit where He comes and sets us apart from the world, opens our eyes, grants us all of those great graces of God, bringing us repentance and faith, and then further, moving from that, does what? Belief in the truth. There is no salvation in any other name than in Jesus Christ. There must be the preaching of the gospel. There must be belief in the truth. And I love the way that it's worded here. It's not simply stated as belief in the gospel, though it is that. It's not simply stated as belief in Christ, though it is that. It says belief in the truth. Because the truth is fixed and unmoving. Now, that's a strange thing in the world in which we live today, where they think truth is variable, shifting by cultures, and independent and individual. It is not. Truth is rooted in God. The gospel is truth. Salvation is truth. The word is truth. And oh, that men and women would by grace get over themselves and lay hold of that which is truth. Through belief in the truth, he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. James 1.18, speaking of that great salvation, uses these powerful words, of his own will. Here we were in our sin, but God looked upon us in mercy and in the exercise of his profound and powerful will, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. What does that mean? In the exercise of his will, he brought us to the occasion where the gospel was made known to us and he brought us forth by that word of truth unto himself that we should be it says a kind of first fruits of his creatures we are those that are dedicated and devoted to him we are his and he is ours what an astounding thing, right? And here's the beautiful thing of it. With regard to the old covenant, it was a temporary covenant rooted in the conditions of faithfulness, perseverance, and obedience. The Israelites broke that covenant, did they not? Yet yeah, to say broke is a little bit too short. They broke and broke and broke and broke and broke until such time as that covenant was brought to its end and a new covenant was put in Jesus Christ. And though that old covenant was one that would come to an end, that new covenant in Jesus Christ is eternal and everlasting because it is ensured by the sacrifice of an indestructible life. It is established by an eternal priesthood. 
that is in Christ himself. And so what a glorious thing to recognize this. God has made his people his first fruits, marked us out. We're his. He especially, lovingly, mercifully engages us. And because of Christ, it's not only engages us, but he works within us, he transforms us, he empowers us, and he provides and uses us. But listen, as a result of what was happening there, it tells us this in verse 3, Israel was holy to the Lord the first fruits of the harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt and disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Now that's a strange sentence. They were not overrun by cannibals. So what's it saying? I mean, it's using that language of this is only to be eaten by some. It's designated. They were set apart to the Lord, and yet others, the enemies were coming in, and they were defiling it. They were wreaking disaster. And as a result of those who would come against God's people, evil fell upon them. It says, disaster, they incurred guilt, and disaster came upon them declares the Lord. We're going to see at the very end of today also, twice in this uh, section of Scripture, it says, declares the Lord. And both of those times, it's following disaster and desolation. We love when he proclaims salvation and deliverance. But know this, he also declares disaster and and judgment. Evil fell them. There is a pattern of consequences that happened throughout the Old Testament. The Assyrians would come in and they would attack and overcome. And then what would God do? Oh, I mean, we could back it up. When the Egyptians began to mistreat them, what did God do? Brought the plagues and delivered them. The Assyrians, God would then bring and deliver them. The Babylonians, bring and deliver them over and over. And all of these things were a picture for the more extraordinary and powerful and permanent deliverance that is ours in Christ Jesus. But it's important to understand this. There is, the scriptures have always wanted us to not miss the fact that wherever there is a crime, there is a punishment. Wherever there are sin, there are going to be consequences. The end of the wisdom book of Ecclesiastes ends this way by saying this, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. Oh boy, that seems pretty comprehensive. He's going to bring every deed to judgment? Well, there's no way he can know about this, though. What does the next part of the verse say? He will bring every deed to judgment with every secret thing. Oh my, so every deed is brought to judgment, whether good or evil. For those who are in the grace of God and he by his grace works good through them, he is the rewarder of those who seek them and we long for the crown of righteousness that he will give to us. But for the rest, every deed will be judged. And this is, there's no escape, right? Right? Every deed will be brought into judgment, and we've considered this regularly. It is either going to be judged on that person who did it, or by the grace of God, it was taken off of me and put upon Christ on the cross, where he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He was accounted sin for us so that I would be accounted righteousness in him. But every sin I ever did even though I will not face that judgment for it, Christ bore that. And not mine, but the sin of all those who would be forgiven. Christ bore it. Well, how could one bear such a multitude of sins deserving of eternal punishment? Because that one was like no other. That was the very eternal holy son of God who was himself the very righteousness of God. And by virtue of his sacrifice, we are accounted righteous in him. 
What a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the scripture reminds us the same kind of thing as we are the first fruits. There are consequences for those who even come against God's people today. Now we are to pray for those who persecute us. We're not wanting them necessarily to pay the price right now, but the reality is someday they will. 2 Thessalonians says it this way in verse, chapter 1, verse 4 and following. As the church is being commended there for their steadfastness, they, true believers don't only begin well, but they persevere, they endure, they remain steadfast. Steadfastness in faith, in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 1. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Since God indeed, listen, God indeed considers it just to repay with afflictions those who afflicted you. So the same kind of things. Those who devour his first fruits, the first fruits of salvation and faith, there are consequences. And to grant you relief who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed, apocalypse, when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Here it's also interesting to note, this is not the old covenant first fruits. This is to the church at Thessalonica. They're nowhere near Judea, nowhere near Jerusalem. This is for all of those who are in Christ Jesus who are under the persecuting hand and brutality of a world that hates truth. And as we stand for truth, and the more boldly we stand for truth, the more we will be brutally bashed. It's just the way that it is. But the Lord sees it. And they will face the consequences of that. But more than that, Jesus is coming and he will give relief from heaven when he is revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal judgment, ruin, destruction, away from the presence of the glory of his might. When he comes when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints where all of the first fruits who have been marked out as holy will be fully made holy what an amazing amazing mercy of God but listen we go from the first thought of the promising commencement to the second thought of this passage, the problematic character. And this is really rooted in uh, what's going on in this passage. Listen to what it says. I call the first one, um, the first thought I want to draw our attention to is the faultlessness of God. God is perfect. He makes no mistakes. He says this in chapter 2, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? What possible answer could be given? There's no wrong ever found in him. For those who are unsure, back to those fathers in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4, the scripture says this, our God the rock his work is perfect and all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Hmm. What wrong did they find in him? None. Psalm 33, verse 4 and 5. The word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his steadfast love. He did them no wrong. And what did they still do? Went away from him. 
because their hearts and minds were fixed upon the world and what it has to offer rather than the creator of the world and his ways. It, it was followed by tragic forgetting of and faithlessness to God. Listen to what it says in verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. They did not say. Okay, so here's the children of Israel. God has done nothing wrong to them, was only faithful to his covenant, gave them mighty victories, provided them uh, harvests from fields others had planted, granted them protection and care and abundance. God looked over them with loving care, and yet it says what? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? They presumed upon the goodness of God they had previously experienced. In other words, today is a little bit difficult. Where is he today? In the midst of today's difficulty, what ought we still be remembering? All the good that he has done. And remember, this is again the exemplar of Israel. He brought us up out of the land of Egypt. He delivered us from the domain of darkness. He delivered us from slavery to sin. He delivered us from death and condemnation to the kingdom of his beloved son and light and life. Yes? I mean, we have a way better claim than they did. How could we forget that? So whatever the difficulty of today, but oh, what he's done for me is already so so great and so undeserved, how can I fail to remember and recount God's great deliverance? But they didn't think about it. They didn't talk about it. They just presumed upon it. Then further it says, who led us in the wilderness, in the desert, in the pits, the land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no, none passes through where no man dwells. Does that sound like an easy place? A comfortable journey? No, it is difficult, near impossible, right? And God has sustained them through all that was difficult and all that was near impossible. So what are they complaining about? How could they forget him? How could they forsake him when, and fail to remember and recount his powerful providential provision, his loving protection in times of trial and trouble and distress and difficulty? He was always there provided for them in the midst of snake attacks, a serpent of bronze they could look upon, provided for them victory over the enemies who would attack them, in days of thirst provided for them water out of a rock, in days of hunger provided them manna and, manna and quails from heaven. What a remarkable God. Then verse 7 says this, And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and good things. And however today may be, we have all had blessed seasons of simple joys that we can look upon and say, God was so good to us, so merciful to us, so loving to us. We ought to be remembering and recounting God's hand in our times of abundance and joy as well as his hand in our times of trial. All of that should be remembered. And if that is the way that we speak and think and remember, will we turn away? You turn, they turned away. Why? They stopped remembering and recounting who he was and all that he's done and who they were to be in him and all that they had experienced from his hand. So much so that I look at this and I think they're, they're turning away from him even as it says, uh, what did I, you find in me that you went far away from me? What an irrational abandoning an unthinkable ungratefulness and an utterly ludicrous leaving of a great God. So much so that God gives this example in verse 10 and 11. He says, think about these other places. The coasts of Cyprus, 
the places of Kedar, these other places. Verse 11 says, has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? Look around at all these people. They're still worshiping the gods of their ancestors and the gods of their ancestors. On occasion, they'll add another one, but rarely do they drop the previous fella. They have stuck with it, and theirs are not even real. Those are not even gods. You had the real God who was truly with you, truly caring and truly protecting, and you turned away from him. And the scary part is the end of that, verse 11, my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit, that which is worthless, that which is empty. So first of all, we see a forgetting and faithfulness of the people. It gets even worse. Well, okay, the people in general for sure, but certainly not the, the priests, right? Right? Pastors and preachers who are committed to the word, they're not going to abandon it, are they? Listen to what it says in verse 8 of Jeremiah 2. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? They're also not contemplating all of their life and their experience through the reality of who God is and what he's done. Then it frighteningly says this, those who handle the law did not know me. That is frightening, isn't it? Oh my, let me, let me show you. The responsibility of those who were priests, Deuteronomy 33.10 says this, they shall teach the, Jacob your rules and Israel your law. That's their first and foremost responsibility is to teach the word. That's what the priests were to do. But the priests didn't even ask and inquire about God, his doings, his being, and his character, and they did not even know him. It's a frightening thing. My mind goes to, and there is in the book of Malachi, a section that speaks of, in chapter 2, God's covenant with Levi. The priestly line and those who would serve in the temple were descendants of Levi. And it says this interestingly of them because they had turned away and failed in their responsibilities. It puts it this way in a powerful word picture regarding their failure. Verse 3 of Malachi 2. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces. Now that is a, a, a powerful and disgusting picture, right? I mean, would you consider, if someone were to do that to you, if you can visualize that momentarily, would you consider that an act of approval and love? Not approval. Would that be a, a sign of despising? Basically, it, it, it is a visual word picture that says you've become not only worthless, but vile and disgusting. And it goes on to say this in this passage. In verse 5, Malachi 2, my covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave it to him. What? kindness and mercy of God to grant that to the descendants of Levi. It was a covenant of fear and he feared me. Oh, what great beginnings, right? He stood in awe of my name. Verse 6, true instruction was in his mouth. Isn't that how it ought to be? No wrong was found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many away from iniquity. Oh, Oh, that that would be true of teachers and preachers and pastors today, right? That their goal wouldn't be to be interesting and relevant and promote growth, but promote what? An awe of God, an understanding of his word, and a turning away from sin. Amen. Oh, that we would see that. But it begins with what? The preacher himself, knowing the word of God, walking in the fear of God. The, the lips of a priest's mouth should be guarded. 
The people should seek instruction from his mouth, not merely encouragement, not merely promises. We want those too, but instruction. For he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But listen to what verse 8 says of them. Despite the good beginnings of the Levites, verse 8 of Malachi 2 says this of those in that day. But you have turned aside from the way. Now, always want to note that the way. There aren't many ways, there is one way. We know that Christ for salvation is the way, the truth, and the life. We are often astounded when we reread the book of Acts how the emphasis in the early church was called the people of the way. There aren't many ways. Narrow is the way, and few are those who will find it. You have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I make you despised and abased before all of the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways but show partiality in your instruction. Here a word from the Bible, there a word from the Bible, the rest, opinions, experiences, feelings, and stories. I tell you, the way is going to lead us into real experiences. It's going to read, lead us into real emotions and feelings and stories. But what we're moved by is the truth. Not just this fella's story. And going, going a little further in Hosea. And this is frightening. The judgment that Hosea is proclaiming in Hosea chapter 4, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There's no faithfulness, no steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. They're swearing, lying, murdering, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. All of these things going on and on and on. And why is this happening? Verse 6 tells us why. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So what does God say? I reject you from being a priest to me since you have forgotten the law of the Lord your God. The church fails to be a light when it no longer upholds the word of God. The church fails to be salt when it no longer walks by the way that is fixed and unchanging says the more that they increase, the more they sinned against him. Oh, the people, the priests, the prominent and the shepherds, chapter 2, Jeremiah 2, verse 8, the shepherds transgressed against me. The leaders who should be living examples have, are transgressing. And again, I note this, transgressed against me. Because ultimately, every sin is ultimately, first and foremost, what? Against God. And then only secondarily against others. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and they went after things that do not profit. They're going after the fleeting, the false and the temporary. Now, I'm not unpacking the shepherds and the prophets as much today because we will address them many more times on our journey through the book of Jeremiah. So let's get to our third uh, thought for today. The prosecution's charges. The language here Really, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, Therefore, I still contend with you. Now, for those who are using the King James, it says, I yet plead with you. They use the word plead, but not in the sense that God is pleading with them, like pleading, pleading, but this is the language of the court of law. I'm filing the pleadings. I'm filing the judgment. This is what's against you. And this is frightening. Because God shatters the mighty without investigation. God doesn't need to call any witnesses. There is even no point in the context of God's court for there to be anyone who would be defense counsel. There is no defense against the sovereignty and knowledge of God. He is fully the judge 
the jury, the investigator, the sentencer from beginning to end. It's all him. This is not up for conversation. I contend to bring a case against you, declares the Lord. And with your children's children, I will contend there are far-reaching consequences to your disobedience. It's important to know this, and we're going to see this in here. With every turning away from God and from what is pleasing to Him, there is a turning to something else that is pleasing from Him. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you is there is no neutral ground. We are either doing all that we do with a view to His glory, or we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It means we've even done our good for an inglorious purpose our own pride, our own boasting, our own recognition by men, so that even then the motives prove to be impure and sinful and insufficient. Matthew Henry here says, cleaving to sin is leaving God. The way that it is stated here in this passage, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. And these two evils are bound up in one action. <laughs> they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They committed two evils. They've forsaken him. What wrong did they find in him that they went far from him? He alone is the living water. And our time is short, so I would encourage you on your own and for those who desire to hear more about it, on Wednesday at to TSTC, we're going to hear a little message from John chapter 4 where Jesus speaks as the one who alone gives the living waters that well up to eternal life. He alone, God alone, is the source and sustenance of life. He is. And not just life in this world, all spiritual life. One of the things that astronomers do as they try to look at different places in the universe, they say, well, we need to determine whether or not this planet is in a habitable region where it could potentially have water which is necessary for life. And this is one of the things the scientists claim one of the rare occasions where they get it right. <laughs> right. But it's not the water of this world that is ultimately necessary for life. It is the water of the word and the spirit of truth. And it is that alone that brings spiritual life and spiritual sustenance. Why would you go somewhere else? No one else has life. No one else has that which will continue to strengthen, support, and sustain you. Why will you go somewhere else? And then the, so that they would understand that, it says that they have followed it up with a futility of lurid worthlessness. What do I mean by that? They have hewed out for themselves cisterns. All right, here you would have a spring of fresh healthy, living water, and instead, you're collecting rainwater and runoff that's going to sit there, you know? It's going to go stale and stagnant. Bugs have access to it, laying their eggs and larvae on the surface of it. In the midst of other things, we, we know from other passages that th these cisterns themselves can even get filled with mud. We're going to see later, Jeremiah is going to be thrown into a cistern and there's no water in there and it says, and he sinks in the mud. Well, let's take a cup of that out and swig it, right? Why would you do that when you have this right there? 
It shows the blindness of the world. They don't see the light that we see. They don't know the life that we have. They don't have this glorious understanding of who God is and what he has given to us in Christ. And more frighteningly than all of that, they're going to that which is waste and worthless. I do have it written here. It was Jeremiah 38, 6 that references the mud in the cistern. But listen, in verse 5 it says this, they went far from me. They went after worthlessness and became worthless. Boy, that's not very encouraging. You say that, it might make me leave with a heavy heart. If you are still living for what is worthless... You ought to have a heavy heart because worthlessness leads to worthlessness. And wait, wait a second. You're making it seem like there are only two options. Either God or worthlessness. Are you really saying that everything else other than him as the principle and pursuit and priority of your life, everything else is worthless? I am saying that. Take this whole world. Give me Jesus. Right? This is what, we, this is what the scriptures are saying. And, and when you lay hold of it, it's not loss. The world thinks I'm missing out on this, missing out on it. You're missing out on worthless. That's nothing. Don't pursue those things. And what we have is great gain. Rich. They, we have a peace that passes understanding that they don't know. We have a hope, a firm confidence beyond this life that they don't understand. We know even now heights of joy they can't even fathom because we know the surety and certainty of the promises that are ours in the person of Christ. And the last consideration for today because these are just preliminary consequences. And again, I've, I've given you more verses there for you to consider on your own. I encourage you to look them up, read through them, and see the tragedy of the direction and circumstances of man and the glory that we were ransomed from the futile, empty, worthless ways we inherited from our forefathers by the precious blood of Christ. The preliminary consequences really are in verse 12. It says this, and it's a statement to the heavens. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. In this context, the idea of appalled is, is someone who's uh, facing uh, shuddering in horror, desolation, deserted, and removed. The idea of being shocked or alarmed here is being horribly afraid and bristling with fear. The, the phrase here, even in here, that says utterly desolate in the ESV basically means abandoned and dried up. It's telling you, listen, it, it's coming. And when it, this is being declared on the heavens, who thinks they're getting away from it? Who's escaping the desolation? Who's escaping the fear and the judgment? None are escaping this. And in case anyone thinks he would, these are declared on the heavens above which everyone generally lives below. Even though for a season, possibly for eight months, someone could be above the heavens, floating around the earth. But they're coming back down. <laughs> Judgment is sure, even as the scripture tells us this. At the end of this, there will be shock and utter de desolation. End of verse 12. Declares the Lord. That is the almighty authority, declares the Lord. There are consequences for sin, and we end with this thought today. This declares the Lord phrase showed up three times in chapter 1. It will show up six times in chapter 2. Declares the Lord. That's not even the, all of the, thus says the Lord, hear the word of the Lord. Just declares the Lord will appear 173 times in the book of Jeremiah. Boy, it really sounds like he's in charge. Really sounds like he makes the decisions. And if he is delivering, there is deliverance. And if he is bringing destruction, 
there is no escape. But oh, that he has let us know there is deliverance from destruction in his son that he delivered to the cross that we would know forgiveness in the risen Savior, the ascended Lord, as we anticipate his coming kingdom. Oh, they started good, didn't they? What a promising beginning. Oh, but what a problematic character from beginning to end, people to priests to prominent to prophets. Everyone went astray in a senseless departure as they did not contemplate the truth and walk in that which was revealed in the word. The charges are proclaimed. You are either fixed firmly upon God in Christ or you are after worthlessness and you will find every pursuit was in vain and brings but destruction. And those consequences are proclaimed by an almighty sovereign God. And we add into that But don't we glory because the God who proclaimed those consequences is the same God who sent his son that we might know salvation. Let us pray and then we will sing together. Lord, we just um, look to you in thankfulness for the time that we're able to spend in your word. Lord, I pray that these clear and basic things that we've reconsidered today, that you would root them in our hearts and minds. Lord, we don't want to waste the days that are given to us. We don't want to be distracted. Thank you that your word reminds us that everything else will pass away. Everything else in comparison to Christ is worthless. Lord, let us not waste our lives. Lord, we pray that we would be set upon the truest treasure and that you by your mercies in Christ would make us your own treasured possession. Lord, we pray that you would stir us to good works. I pray, God, that there would not be any here who had begun and then proved to have no root in them. Lord, we do know that there are some who begin and then there may be a season of distraction, a season of of backsliding and misunderstanding. God, would you use the warnings of your word this day if indeed they are your your people? Would you use your word to turn them back to you? to turn them from that which is waste. Lord, we pray that you would continue in our hearts that desire for you, that earnest pursuit of you, because you are great, you are sovereign, you are worthy to be praised. Lord, you are the living water, the source of our earthly and spiritual life and sustenance, and we give you all praise and glory. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.